Welcome to Conversations with Z and Vindesh, a weekly discussion that explores common life challenges and offers practical solutions. Learn more at dharmamedia.com. That's D H A R M A media.com. Hey, welcome everybody to another DPO. This is just Fashion Observer here at the Dharma Health Institute, the Dharma Media. We're going to do something a little different today. Uh, Roddy is out for the day. He's very busy doing uh, Roddy type things, uh, working on a spoken word project. But I do have my beautiful niece here, uh, Sierra, to sit and sit in in place of Roddy and be uh, a voice of reason and understanding in our project. This project that I'm I'm on with the Century Project with the Dispassion Observer, is an opportunity to get us to think for ourselves, to think different, to have an understanding of how people arrive at their thoughts and the way that they perceive the world. Uh, we live in a world where there are many crises of the human condition, health crises of all kinds, emotional crises, a lot of mental health issues going on. And those things lead to the world that, as we see it, uh, being in a not so healthy place. We are for the first time in many years on the verge of a nuclear war. Uh, it seems to be that people are marching towards more conflict as opposed to less. There is a sort of feudal uh, shadow hanging over media. That's one of the reasons we want to do Dharma media. We'd like to have a platform of not only free speech, but free thought, the ability to engage and develop ourselves. So today, Sierra and I are going to be talking about a few things. First thing, she is uh, maligning boomers. And uh, I happen to be a boomer. I was born in the middle of the last century. She was uh, born in the first quarter of the new century. So we're going to hash it up. So you just said that boomers are just losers. <laughs> and, I, I, and I'm okay with that because there are some boomers that are losers. I think I'm great, I'm wonderful, you think I'm great and wonderful. Tell me about the rest of these boomers, and what's the difference between your, your generation and, let's say, Caitlin's the millennials? I find that all of you are uh, very interesting. Uh, you don't seem to be able to do anything. <laughs> um, you're real good with the digital world. You're good with VR, uh, robo, hey. robo sex, all these things that you guys are into. Um, I don't know how that's going to sustain humanity, but again, I'm on my way out, you're on your way in. So let's talk about it. What are your thoughts on how the older people see the world, how you see the world, and how that generation in between, like Caitlin and these folks, uh, what would you say, baby girl? I think the older generation, like the boomers and the ones even before them, like the, the ones that are kind of There's nothing out. before us. I mean, like the... They're all dead. Are those boomers, like the 80-year-olds, 90-year-olds, yeah, 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 that's still yeah, boomers? Yeah, oh, okay. yeah I'm, I'm, I'm 70 years old. Okay, so let's get it together, all right? <laughs> that's not that old. Okay, keep going. I won't interrupt. <laughs> I think because the boomers feel like the kind of, not in an offensive way, halfway out the door. Very offensive. Okay, go on. <laughs> I think, like, there's less kind of... Um, I'd say motivation for change, like in the sense the boomers don't Give me really an see it. We, we made the world. We figured it out. Everything you made, have is yeah. because of boomers. Yeah. We, Good and bad. we yeah. can fix things. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. It's like they did their stuff, they invented their things, fix? and now they're dying. Then they have... then. <laughs> I'm giving you a quick rundown. Okay. Then... I feel like the millennials are more focused on like getting out of the corporate world and going on hikes and submerging themselves in nature. And so how do they make them eating it? granola bars? I don't know. I feel like they're the big like COVID workers, stay at home kind of people that so, still do like so what's their purpose? Conventional jobs. I think they're really the change of like working to live and not living to work. Mm -hmm. Like they're the generation that kind of said enough of, you know, like being a rat in the rat race and like, let's find a way to live a life outside of work. 
<laughs> and then we have the Gen Zs. That's you guys. Yeah, unfortunately. Who are like totally off the rails. Took the millennial kind of approach of I don't want to live like a corporate life being stuck in a company like from nine to five, whatever. And they don't want to do anything, like anything at all. And so, Very fragile. Gen, yeah, Gen Z are like the ones that haven't been in work environments from a young age, that don't have never, much work experience. Never show. So when it comes to like my age, you start, you know, getting freaked out over all that stuff because it's so overwhelming because you've oh, never done anything stuff. before. Like adult responsibility. Simple working, yeah, like yeah, anything. Yeah, yes. <laughs> That's, that's that's a good point. You made a good point. But so I think like that also created some sort of fragility in people is because mental health. Especially yeah, because especially in my generation, everybody thinks that it's possible to become an influencer and make thirty thousand dollars off of it. Oh, you don't know what that is. What, what, what's that? Influence what? I know what an influence fuse is on an A nine missile. You're gonna freak out. What's an influence? An influencer is someone who, honestly, by luck, really, you have to be good looking, number one. That's the first criteria. I got that. You have to be, right. <laughs> you have to be good looking. You have to have a social media platform. I got that. And basically, you talk to the camera and you're like, oh, today I went and did this and spent the day with me. Because people want to see it. Who wants to see People that? are sitting on their phone and want to see somebody else live a day in their life because they don't care about that. <clears throat> okay, so this is an aspiration of your generation. Yeah, I guess it's, it's more... I don't even think it's an aspiration as much as it is like a twisted reality to most people. Yeah, that's it. Like most people my age are recording this and that how we were talking about in the car, you know, like when there's a shooting or whatever, people now think, let me pull out my phone instead of let me survive, right? It's like it's the same thing. It's everybody thinks that their food is worth somebody else seeing or that their video of them falling or whatever it is or them talking or them shopping how does that is interesting. Work? Explain how does that work? How is their meal interesting? People are chronically online. And but how is that interesting? Because people don't care about themselves anymore. They care about other that. people. Like, my generation is so filled with judgment and viewing the other person as a problem or looking at somebody else before we look inwards. Like, that's a huge thing. That's why my generation is terrible with communication. That's why they're not hardworking. Like, it's, it's all together. Mm. Okay, you painted a, a pretty bleak picture uh, of your generation. How is how are they to survive, and how can we stay away from them? I feel like some of them have really got it figured out. Like the ones that kind of go on this like hippie journey. I mean, also it all depends on what you want out of life, right? Like I think I want something different than. A business major and university. What do you want? I want to get like some house in a forest with a farm and grow my own food and die there. Okay, okay. that's kind of like what I want to do, but I, I lived a long life to get to that point. You haven't really. I'm got any... like I'm already. I'm already. You're ready reached. to retire before you start working. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yeah, this is crazy, but I'm gonna, uh, for the sake of our audience. This is a nice insight, a generational insight to get us a better understanding of the world we live in, the people we share the world with. I'm a bit confused still, but I love what I'm hearing from dear girl. Um, so how does that work? You retire, but you've never worked. How does that work? I think it's more retiring from the events that take place through one's life, not necessarily like events? even making money. Like I think... Kids my age are so done with the way the world is, like, so beyond disappointed. And I think most people feel like a big part of it is out of their control. Mm -hmm. Like, let's be real, the people running the U.S. are very much untouchable. This guy, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan mm -hmm. and Chase, He's really one of the dudes that's like behind the U.S. running the economy of the U.S. He's not any president or whatever. I think he will be soon, but he's still like somebody that we can't really get to. You know what I mean? So I think 
the people in our generation are just like tired, like consumed of everything that has come before them, that they're so like traumatized by things sure, that sure. haven't even happened to them, but just that hopelessness that they just want to like get out of any. Well, that's hopeful. I think the youth are always the ones that steward change. And I think that the challenge I have is understanding the mechanism and the vehicle in which they will use to be changed since so many of them seem crippled. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't say it. It seems like they're too fat, too gay, too entitled, too theatrical, too self-interested uh, to really be actionable. Mm. But again, that's a boomer talking. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, the world has definitely changed in terms of like how men, how much people express themselves and that. Even in your lifetime. Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like when I was a kid, I didn't really see like any very like exuberant gay communities or anything like you that. Say when you were a kid, what was that like five years ago? <laughs> like yeah. when I was like, I don't know, when I was like 10, even to 12, 13, that was 10 years ago. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I don't know, I think when I, I, I don't know if it's because I was getting older and I was getting more exposure or because it was happening more. And you notice that even in a decade, in your short lifespan, yeah. there's been a radical social change. Yeah, for sure. There's been so much more fighting violence with violence instead of, I think like my parents' generation were a big peace generation mm-hmm. in that way. True. And our generation is like fighting violence with more violence and stripping history and whatever it is for the sake of like people that have come before them and victims of any sort of persecution. But like what they don't realize is by doing that, you're taking away any tactile history that people can work with to then learn. I think that's a that, that's a good point you make, because I see it from maybe one perspective, I lived history, like, and then what people don't know, Mm. what the the, the level of what people don't know, and then what's stated as fact. Yeah. I was listening to something on the news then, and they said, oh, college students have never protested. I I don't know what rock that person was under, but college students have always protested. Yeah. So in my lifetime, uh, we protested the Vietnam War. We, we, We fought for civil rights. And they, all those people were persecuted the exact same way. Mm. It, 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 this is the first time in many years. Was there looting to that extent? Like well, there was always, training? there was always, anytime you get large groups of people together fighting kind of the concept of the corporation, there's going to be incidents, events of all kind. Right. So during, and, 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 and here, here again, I hear it repeated. So anybody fighting against war were labeled as terrorists, communists, anti-social, anybody that bucked the status quo, Mm -hmm. didn't go along with the government line. Civil rights workers were considered worthy only of death. The hoses that were sprayed on them would rip their skin off. Dogs were sicked on them. They were hunted, killed. There was a whole department in the U.S. called the Counterintelligence Program, CounterPro, just tapping phones, assassinating protesters. And this was in my lifetime. Then we fast forward to the Vietnam War. Uh, all the kids were against the war because most of them went to war. The people that call for war never go to war. They they recruit the young. They suck the blood out of the young. They, they kill innocents. And so um, when I was a young person growing up, where Cal Berkeley, where the, the war, there were people getting shot on the street, disperse or you will be shot. People were okay with them being shot. Because they were saying we, the Vietnam War is a, is not a good war. It's a wrong war. It's an inhumane war. War in itself. The young people were against war. Mm. And the people who were for war, who profited off war, who benefited from war, and who would come up with the propaganda of war, the, the domino effect. They had, if you let Vietnam uh, be communist or have their own way, the whole world would turn into Russia or something like that. And you're also working with a country who is willing to send 18-year-old boys to go fight, but not the... <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. you could, you could buy, yeah, you could you couldn't buy liquor or guns, but you could go to war. And so <clears throat> then you fast forward, there was the Iraq War. Everybody said, hey, let's really find out the truth 
they were shut down, you're with terrorists, you're with this. And it's the same thing played over and over and then amplified. And if you don't know history, if you don't know pathology, if you don't know the forensics of a thing, you will repeat it. Mm -hmm. And I see that now um, in the narrative of the news is that it's, it's a very weird narrative that anyone who has dissent against a corporate view is some sort of really bad person. They'll turn the camera and aim at that, but never show you the whole picture. They never talk about causality. It's kind of like the way we sell drugs. Take Ozempic and you'll get skinny. Mm -hmm. They never say stop going to McDonald's. Yeah. They never say that. And, and so this has been a common theme and it's been kind of put on steroids in the, in the, with, with new technology. And so I'm hearing what you're saying, but I would also offer that, that that's already happened, that you have, for those of us who live through things, mm. we have witnessed it firsthand. Yeah. And it's scarring, it's traumatizing, all those sorts of things. But you can see the pattern. So it seems to be that the older generation, my generation, the same people who were against human rights, civil rights, whatever, uh, when they were younger, they didn't take a stand. Now they tend to be those who want to maintain the status quo of the military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. and Or they just don't want to deal with anything. They just want to keep their head down, look the other way, maybe watch a ball game, yeah. have a beer. Um, but it's up to you guys to make the changes in the world or hopefully keep us in a better direction. And I feel like the problem with, um, with you guys, with um, Gen Z, is you don't have the physical ability to do anything because the computer has taken over your life. It's taken over your brain with texting and the iPhone. It's taking over your bodies with VR and AI. Uh, the loss of the ability to communicate with one another prevents you from really coming up with action plans. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I'm just thinking that because, again, I'm from a more primitive, tactile time where every guy you met had who worked had calluses on his hands from working right. and having a visceral thing. You guys don't have that. Yeah, and that's another thing, too, is like the weakness of the man in our generation, like the talk more about that. the femaleing, femaleizing men, feminizing, femini like feminizing men. You know, like stripping men from their natural state. Like, so where does that leave you as a young lady? Uh, in this time in the world and, and, and your options of a possible meet where you have to go with a robot, a, a so donor, a, a, a dig bot. I mean, I don't know. What do you guys do nowadays with, since the pickings are very thin? It's literally like, I mean, I'm sure there are, but the, very few, but it's like two sides. You have like the extreme macho men that hate this movement of the feminizing men and whatever. So they're on like a whole disrespecting women type lore, right? And so they don't think women are capable, whatever. This you've seen before in your generation. Then on the other side, you have like these extremely baby men mm -hmm. that feel like oh, before me, the men had to work and the woman was at home, blah, blah, blah. So now I'm going to be at home and the woman's going to do all the work. Caitlin seems to understand that. Is that also in your generation? Is that a problem with your crew? I That's funny. think so. I feel, like, I feel so like the well. millennials are more equal in that sense. I think the millennials... I think more of, uh, especially the women, fall into the more masculine. I think we, our, our generation, started it. hit that hardest. Okay, they started it, and yeah. you got the in the bad results from that. We just go, like, yeah, the females, I mean, we see it too in statistics where it's like white college women are growing and white college men are at an extreme yeah. low for the mm -hmm. first time and whatever. And so it's like, you start asking yourself questions when you ask a man, you're on a date or whatever. It's like, what are you looking for? 
and he says, oh, I want to stay home all day. And, <laughs> and, and the woman, she's still going to cook. She's still going to clean, but she's also going to go to work and she's going to make the money. And instead, I'm going to live the woman life. But wouldn't you say that's a consequence of even in my generation, uh, maybe some of the the failings of the feminist idea that it was kind of confusing anyway, where, uh, again, I'm going to, I don't own the truth, so I'm going to say, I think a lot of the feminist movement in that idea was lesser masculinity. Like yeah. a, a woman who behaved like equal, a man, yeah. but didn't have muscles and couldn't punch you out, but is still a guy, and then create rules of reducing the mono on mono conflict of men. Mm. But you can still act in a male role, and then that was kind of a cool thing to do. Um, but it wasn't like a powerful woman; it was like a lesser man. Yeah, like feminism. You, know, you know what I'm saying? Is like I feel like a lot of the feminism stuff, which my mother was deeply involved in the feminist movement, was more about being a, a, a less muscular man than it was being a very it's powerful cool. feminine energy. Is that? Sound too crazy? No. Yeah. That, I mean, I wasn't there, so I don't know how it all struck it. But I definitely wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, well, I was there. And, um, <laughs> and it, it, was, uh, it was that kind of thing. And I see the end result of that is, as you described now, you have the, this gender pluralism where there's these highly effeminate men and very masculine women. Mm. And then that clashes, I think, with certain functions of nature that were evolved over many millennia. Yeah. That how we interact with each other socially, intimately, and everything else. And now in your generation, you have a surrogate to human relationships, which is the computer, yeah. which is the advancements of AI, that there are men growing up and their first intimate experiences are virtual reality and online. So where does that lead, leave an actual human being? Lack of responsibility. And accountability for oneself, like... And how has that played out for you in terms of socially uh, dating and all that? And by the way, I want to meet your boyfriend so I can beat his ass. But I don't trust him. Never met him, but I don't trust him. So that's the way old school was. You used to have to go to the uncles and everything. He had a boyfriend. He'd get beat up. Then if he could take the beating, he could stay with I him. I can't even... I cannot. That's how he used to I do I can't it. even do that. Did you even beat Kyle yet? Yeah, I did. That's why he's really good now at tension. I, yeah, he knows better. He knows better. So they get it. They don't want to tussle with you. <laughs> we dropped a bomb on innocent people. Okay. So anyway. Dropped a bomb on this. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. But you know, I think like the lack of responsibility thing is huge. Like if I even just look at myself. And I know I'm not as average as a lot of people in my generation, but when a camera's in my face, I know not to say certain things. <laughs> if somebody's recording me, I know to be careful of certain things because that could mean thrown out of college, no more job, whatever. My parents, your generation, you guys never had to worry about that. You never had to worry about somebody, which has happened to me, being recorded in secret, right? Like oh, we, we opening had, up to somebody and they're We had a different version you. that was called the Counter Intelligence Program, a guy named Jager Hoover. Yeah, yeah. right. He would tap right. your toy in like, your it was, it was. I get what you're but saying. But for the average Joe that's sitting there at a dinner table with their friend and you don't expect that to happen, and it does, and it's like you yeah. don't you're not prepared to take as much responsibility as you probably were yeah, yeah. had there not been that type of stuff in your face. A yeah. very, very different. A very, you know, ours was counter surveillance or, or bugging people's rooms and they, they had to be iconic people or framing people. Yeah. And it was all done by a central government office that later on would be exposed and all that. This can you be guys, done now by somebody who hates you. Just random people. And an idiot and, too. And you guys have what the, uh, the AI generated deep fakes. Yeah. You guys got a lot to do with it. I, I think more of my bigger concern is as you guys move forward, what does that mean in terms of connecting with other human beings in a real temporal way, in a visceral way? I mean, you grew up with people having the option of never interacting with another human being yeah. or never even communicating. You can just 
you, you know, when you're texting and we're doing all these kinds of things, you, you're not truly communicating with another human being. Yeah. How has that shaped you? And how, how do you understand how that has made you guys more susceptible to anxiety, more susceptible to various forms of, of, of mental stress? Because there is something very primitive about our human needs to mm -hmm. connect. We communicate not just with our words, but with our face, the tone of our voice, with our touch, with our well, so yeah. many different ways we communicate with one another. That's all gone. Yeah. So what is, where does that leave you guys? I think it leaves us at a stage where in the next 10 to 20 years, and I don't even want to think of like Gen X, I think, the ones that come after us. Because like, I remember babysitting kids that couldn't even look at me. Mm. Like, could not look into somebody else's eyes because, because they're not uh, used to it. IPad, so, so. Because they don't know what it's like to, like, be wow. held accountable by somebody across from you. Wow, that's scary. So, that's, like, beyond. I don't even want to think about that, and I hope I'm long gone before I see the results of wow. that generation. Wow, yeah, that's a good point. But in my generation, first of all, I think rates of marriage are going to plummet like no tomorrow. Mm -hmm. People aren't ready to commit to other people like that anymore because also in our generation, everything is so fast paced. We never had to go to a library to get our knowledge. We just had to pick up our phone that most of our generation got at 10, 11 years old because mm -hmm. our parents were too thick to think about the effects of what was going to happen mm -hmm. to us had we gotten it that young. Mm -hmm. You pick up your phone, you find Gemini or ChatGPT, and that's how you do your homework, and you're not actually ever thinking. You don't have the patience to think. When you're watching videos on your phone, TikTok, whatever, they're 15 seconds. Mm. You see kids that can't even watch a 15-second video. They're getting bored of 15 seconds. So the patience, the hard work, the resilience, gone out the window. Wow. <laughs> that's a scary picture. That's a, what would you, what kind of movement or a thought project would you think would be beneficial? Because uh, let's just go back just for a minute because I'm looking at generational things and historically older people have a more conservative way of thinking, even if it's good, whether it's good or bad, doesn't matter. People get used to it. The older you get, the longer you've done something, the more use you are, to, you, the more you're yeah. used to that thing and the way they go, the status quo. Yeah. So I think that's just a, an issue of time, frequency, you know, redundancy, um, and just drill compels habits of obedience. So you've been doing something for so long, you're used to things being a certain way. Yeah. And so my project here is what I want to do is do something disruptive, is not tell people how to think, but get them thinking. <laughs> and even if we don't, come to the same conclusion, we can observe how we came to that. And then in that observation, we reflect upon our journey. What shaped you? What made you? What happened to you? How did you become who you are? Why do you believe what you believe? And then you can lay everything out like on a spreadsheet in a sense. You know what the board. fear I have with that is? <clears throat> I don't think people even know how to think anymore. In the sense that, like, I don't know if you can even get people thinking for themselves anymore. Because oh. if you look at any sort of activism or any, you know, like sharing of knowledge in my generation, I can pick up my phone right now. Every post is about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict right now. Everybody is saying, giving their two cents on what's happening. You're not there. You never did a never the history the class. You, you're looking at your phone and you're being fed some bullshit from this news reporting company that wants you to believe this. Same. And so people get their knowledge from other people's knowledge. So all knowledge. this shit of like fake news and all that is because people at some point it gets made up, right? Like people don't need to think anymore. They don't form their own opinion. And that's why I said, I, I think whoever's out there to really think, and I think there are formulas. There are formulas, for example, you use in medicine. You look at etiology. You look at signs and symptoms. And that's how you understand 
where a person's at with their health. Signs and symptoms. <clears throat> signs are what you can actually see. Symptoms are what the person describes. Or certain measures, right? There are certain things you can see. Or you can see your bone is sticking out of the side of your leg. They say their lower leg hurts, they can't walk. That's something broken in the leg, right? It's kind of straightforward. Mm -hmm. It's a straightforward map. I think societally, we've lost the ability to do that situational algebra of society. When you look at conflicts around the world, they all have a common genesis. If you start looking at patterns, for example, um, that gets into really troubling areas where there's always seems to be a religious angle on conflict. And I think if we could collectively think about that, I'm not telling people to abandon their religion, or, but just think about how those biases mm. and tribalism things manifest. Yeah. First, people identify them uh, by their religion. We talked about that with Buddhism, stuff like that, why I like it so much. Um, and then you get into other ident national identities. I'm French, I'm American, Americans are this way, Canadians are this way. Who told you that? Mm. Especially if you never met a Frenchman or a Canadian or you never met an Ecuadorian, how can you say how they are? And so somebody tells you that, and that person is usually what people call a trusted source. A trusted source is a source of information that resonates with you, what they're saying. And you can do experiments on that. There's this experiment I talked about last week with Ryan where there was a thing called um, uh, party over policy. It was an experiment they did to show that people are so biased towards their group that if they announced that our group, their group did something really horrible, then you oh, turn around and say, oh, no, folks, that was my group. Then you would justify that same thing. Yeah. And so that's what we see playing out in the world. Yeah. And for those of us who are thinking and maybe wanting a better world, maybe we can't save the world, but we want to save ourselves, or our family, to appreciate what goes on inside of us mm -hmm. across the spectrum, be it boomer to to Z generation, be it ethnically, with these, these false identities about race, just understand that we all have these biases and those things will alert us and that's part of marketing. So you can sell us things. So if you have a podcast of guys who, I've been noticing these podcasts with a lot of the guys that are mad at women, uh, some of them have interesting things to say, but a lot of them are just mad at their own dating life. Like the Andrew Tatos. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, he has a lot of interesting things to say, yeah. but then he's real mad. And then he about, ruins it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Like right when you should give it a break, then you push harder. Yeah. And I've seen other people who flip flop. So just for the, just for the likes and the draws or the followership, they say outrageous things mm -hmm. and they'll have something nice to say. And then when they lose that appeal, I guess that's what you call an influencer. So when they lose that appeal, they'll change to something else. So there's no integrity. Rebranding. Yeah, there's no integrity. And the more that we as a public buy that, the more it goes on. And what we're trying to do is I just want people to think. And the first thing is mitigate human suffering. How can we mitigate <laughs> human suffering? And, and, and that idea of understanding one another, whether you agree or not, how did you come to your view? Mm -hmm. Like I'm sitting talking to you and you've enlightened me on some of the thinking of the X generation, which isn't that far off from some of my thinking. Like your worries or concerns are very similar to my concerns. Like how do these, I got kids growing up, how do they even get partners mm -hmm. in this day and world? How do you even find something that's very human for all the time we've been human beings, we had opportunity to have partners. And now that's going away. I think the good news about that is that a lot of, and it also depends where you live, you know, like when I speak to my friends in Europe, they're still way, like they're still with my parents. They think the same way as the... Your friends your age. Yeah. So it, it also depends like what you've been exposed to here. It's like a whole different story, you know, like my now that we're getting older, one of my closest friends just got a job as a teacher. She's still going through university, but there's like this program mm -hmm. in Canada where they do like part-time teaching or whatever because she's in education. She is calling me, telling me that parents are screaming at her 
for her disciplining children. Yeah. Parents are coming into the school and saying, how dare you tell my child to put his phone down when you're talking? So how do so, you teach? So people have really gone to, you don't, that's the issue. Then you have people that have seen that, and usually it's the generation after, so hopefully mine and a lot of millennials that it's happening already, that are forcing this idea of making your kids stay in nature and playing outside and not get a cell phone and whatever. And you see that, that positive change. Sure. And I think that's only going to grow with the generations that were victims to the total opposite, right? So, like... But don't you think that that will lead to more polarization? That we'll, we'll be more entrenched in different camps? Like, we'll have the, the modern primitives versus the modernist, you know, the, 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 the tech-embellished person versus the low-tech person. Because it's hard to bridge those gaps. For sure. If you're at a school and, and you want to dictate to the teachers how to treat your particular child at the detriment of every other child. Well, you can do that. Like, as a parent, I believe that, like, at the end of the day, you're the one in charge of But should child. my parent teach their um, own kid in their own environment and not put them in the public square if they well, don't want them disciplined? Yes and no, because I think also... If you're a parent, you keep your kid with you all the time. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to have a child that's like psychologically fucked up when they have to leave the but house. It was your choice. I think as a parent, at the end of the day, the school, like in terms of school and education, whatever, and like the access to information that your child mm -hmm. gets, the school works for you. You know, like those people are well, working for your child. What if your, your parent is an idiot? You see what I'm saying? This is the issue, right? There's too many of everything. That's a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what no, I'm getting. like. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm getting at. Is like you can't have it all and then deal with the common community. You know what I'm saying? Correct. Like if you are in a class, like my little one is playing football, and he is very capable in his sport, but most of the kids on the team are complete dullards. They they can't. Physically, they're just not there. So what the team has done is my son doesn't play as much, so he gives the kid, they give the kids a chance. They can't play more chances to play, so they're losing every game. My son is losing interest in it. But in some bizarre logic, those parents with the, the kids that aren't that capable are very happy that their kids get to participate. But my son, he's like, I, I, don't, want to do, I don't really want to do it because it's almost embarrassing to watch. Challenged. Yeah, and, and so you're in a public square, and that's all I'm saying is that these are things that if we keep, if we do the math and we watch where that goes, you're going to have a more polarized society. Yeah. What about people who are into common gender roles, male, female? Where do they go in this world now where it's about extreme gender ambiguity or fluidity, whatever they call it? And what, what if that's not your thing? I, I rail on and stuff too about dogs in restaurants. What if I want to go to a restaurant? And so it starts to polarize people. So I think if we're headed in this direction, wouldn't you, wouldn't you think that? That we become My even thing more separate. Save yourself. Yeah, well, like, that's, that's, at this that's, what point, that's what I think. That's why I just my niece. At, all the time. at this point, like, so let them all go crazy on each other like zombies and attack each other and whatever, and then realize like they have no idea what they're doing and they don't have it. What do I say all the time? I got a big tank out there for the zombie apocalypse. Yeah. See, we, so we came. I see that one coming too. Well, that's, it. that's what I'm saying. Save yourself. Get a bunker in the woods. Don't tell anybody. Take your family, and that's it. We call it opt out. Yeah, like I'm. I'm out of here. Like I'm not. I. I do not identify with any of this. I do not belong. I do not feel happy. Like the not none of it. The pressure. The university. The friends. The unreliability. The, <laughs> I'm so done with it that I'm just willing to work on myself and make sure I'm okay. So okay that I can be with myself okay. for the rest of my life. And well, with that, it. you are here from a Gen Zer, agreeing with a boomer. <laughs>
We're not that far apart. What, I'm, what I, I gain from this conversation, I hope everybody out there gain that, is if we listen to each other long enough, we'll arrive at a common understanding. And you, it comes down to this. You have people come together because they have common temperaments. I agree with what Sarah is saying. I totally agree. At the end of the day, that's what we do here, right, Darwin? Dar we look after each other, and we create an energetic field, and, and we're very careful who comes into that so we can be true to ourselves. We can nurture, cultivate healthy, well-living. And that's what I've been saying all along is there's a group of people, we call them opt-outs. They've opted out of the madness. And from there, cultivate yourself. Because what we, what we this was the conclusion I came to, listening to Sierra. It's a hopeless situation unless you save yourself. You will be, like you said, zombies. You'll be like in the zombie show where you say, hey, that's my old friend Joe. No, he's a zombie. He's not Joe anymore. Well, let me go let Joe in. No, no, Joe's going to eat you. So you can't help Joe anymore, mm. right? Oh, that's my Aunt Becky. No, no, she's gone. And so that's where we're at, right? Mm -hmm. We're at a point where people can't have an, a normal conversation with members of their own family. Wow. That's how far we have gone, where it's like a political opinion gets in the way of kids being yeah. able to speak to their parents at the dinner table. So with that, God bless. I'm out. I'm going to focus on and myself. That, we're out and out. It. See you guys next week. Thank you very much. We'll have Roddy back real soon. Thank baby Sierra for being here and helping us out. And again, opt out. If you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on Podbean, iTunes, or your favorite podcasting app. Each five-star review helps us bring you more unique and insightful content. Learn more at dharmamedia.com. Peace.